From Bloomberg News and iHeartRadio, it's The Big Take. I'm Wes Kosova. Today, a devastating year of war in Ukraine. February 24th marks one year since Russia invaded Ukraine. In a televised speech at the time, President Vladimir Putin described the attack not as the start of a war, but what he called a special military operation. Putin and his generals anticipated Ukraine's army would fold and Russia would quickly capture Kiev, the capital. As we've all seen, of course, that did not happen. Ukraine's military has fought back Russia's forces. Against all odds and doom and gloom scenarios, Ukraine didn't fall. Ukraine is alive and kicking. And Europe and the U.S. have provided Ukraine with guns, ammunition, and drones. And advanced missiles and tanks may soon be on the way. We will not only support financially, but also empower Ukraine to make the most of its potential. And, uh, and we've given Ukraine what they needed when they needed to defend themselves. And since the invasion, that has resulted in more than $20 billion in terms of security assistance. But the war has taken a terrible toll. Thousands have died. Cities and homes have been destroyed, and millions of Ukrainians who fled are now living as refugees in other countries. In Ukraine, just into Poland, and that's just in the last 12 days, those numbers continue to grow. This is the biggest refugee crisis Europe has faced since World War II. And here on the ground... As Ukraine braces for an expected next wave of Russian attacks, I asked my colleagues Darina Krasnoludska and Mark Champion in Kiev and Roz Matheson in London to take stock of all that has happened in the past year and what lies ahead. Dasha, after a year, I suppose one of the most important things that's happened is what hasn't happened, which is that Russia has failed in its effort to take over Ukraine and that Ukraine still stands as a nation. You're in Kyiv right now. Can you describe what it's like there and in the country right now? It's quite loud now on the streets when the electricity is cut off and it still happens on a daily basis. Uh, You walk on the main street and you can hear that quite loud noise from generators and also the smell is not perfect, but shops are working, hairdressers are working, business is working. So in that regard, yeah, Ukrainians uh, are fighting in every possible way. How are the Ukrainian people feeling about the state of what's happening now. It's obviously been an enormously traumatic year. We see lots of funerals now because fighting is very severe in the eastern part of the country. But still, Ukrainians are not ready to lay down their weapons. And uh, the president himself feels this, you know, desire to fight further. Ukrainians' uh, main thought is that if we allow Russia to take at least part of our land, In several years, it will rebuild its forces again, and it will try to seize more of our land. We saw that back in 2014, when uh, there was a fragile peace accord with Russia, but it just resulted in a full-scale war just several years later. So this time, Ukrainians are determined to regain control on all the territory and try to keep push Russia back uh, as much as possible. If I can just add just a little bit to what uh, Dasha was saying, Um, I come in and out, you know, Dasha lives here uh, the whole time. So when I was last here in October, it's kind of noticeable to me, at least, is that the mood, I think, is a little more sober, a little more grim. You can tell that it's been a very hard winter for the reasons that uh, Dasha was laying out. But also, you know, in October, you just come off these two very successful counteroffensives. There was quite a bit of optimism. And the main question for people was, you know, well, the winter's coming in, it'll slow down. But the question was, when will our next offensive be? And now coming back, it's not that people are pessimistic or that they've given up in any sense. It's just it's more sober, more grim. And the question now is, well, you know, when exactly will the Russian offensive begin? Uh, and the answer to that is it's 
you know, if it hasn't begun already, it'll be soon. And, you know, we're going to need to survive that before we get our turn. So that's the main thing that has struck me in recent months. Can you give a sense of right now how much of Ukraine is occupied by Russian forces, how much of it is in the control of Russian forces, and how much is in Ukraine's firm hands? Um, It's hard to estimate because obviously we need to rely on official data. What Ukraine regained, uh, it seems to me that uh, at least what the uh, official information is, and that's what I also hear from people I know and who are battling now in uh, the east and in the south, the the area that Ukraine regained, they managed to build some good defensive lines. So even if Russia starts uh, counteroffensive or another offensive, uh, it won't be that easy for them to take uh, again, for example, Kherson under their control or move much uh, further in the south of Ukraine. It's around Zaporizhia region. But again, Russia managed to build quite strong defense lines in the area in Donbass region. So for Ukraine, if and when it starts its counteroffensive, it's going to be very difficult to advance in any of those uh, directions that people actually expect it to, to advance. Razi Yurgov Vladimir Putin believed his military would quickly defeat Ukraine, uh, that Kiev would practically fall overnight. Obviously, that hasn't happen. How did Putin and his generals get this so wrong? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm sure Mark has some views on this also, because there was a lot written in the run-up to the war about the fact that Russia had spent an enormous amount of money over a period of years modernizing its military. It had a very large land army. It was considered to be very well trained. There was the expectation, as you say, that that, that even though Ukraine had had uh, previous experience in combat, that the Russian troops would simply be superior, uh, better organized, better equipment, and so on. And the sort of mystique that came around that. And what we really saw is, is in fact, big questions now about where did all that money go to that big Russian modernization that we all wrote about and heard about for years? Because it certainly didn't go into training and good equipment, um, going by what we've seen happen on the ground in Ukraine. So certainly a lot of it was probably funneled off in corruption. Perhaps there were lots of people who just simply told the Russian president, no, 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 the military is terrific. This will be an easy walkover for you. No one was prepared to tell him the reality of the state of his own military, uh, which had degraded. But we've seen, you know, from the action on the ground, not just sort of questions about the capacity of the troops or the equipment, but really sort of fundamental questions about the way the military is organized or disorganized in this case, in terms of the leadership structure, command and control, all of it has seemed to be pretty poor. Um, And the question is, why simply has Russia not done better? If you want a phrase on the ground, but I'm sure Mark has some observations about that too. Yeah, I think that's that's all right. Uh, you know, and if you had to prioritize, you know, because I mean, a lot of people in a lot of militaries outside Russia and Ukraine have been, you know, working pretty hard to figure this out because it really matters. You know, it really matters whether uh, the Russians just sort of messed up this time or whether there's something seriously wrong with the way that they fight with the equipment they have, and that changes everybody's calculations. And I think for a lot of analysts and, you know, sort of defense ministries and so on, the tendency is to say, well, the number one reason why they did so poorly was really down to Putin and his immediate entourage who directed the plan for action more or less without the generals, because they wanted uh, an element of surprise. They also didn't inform even quite senior commanders, and certainly not the troops until even the day of uh, invasion. Um, So they were extremely ill-prepared. They made all the wrong assumptions, and they therefore went in in ways that really have nothing to do with warfare. It was like a parade. So, And the, the lasting problem there is that they lost a lot around Kiev and in those early uh, weeks, they they lost really very large numbers of their best troops. They sent their best people in, their best trained people, their best equipped, you know, their airborne forces and so on, and they were decimated. And now these troops have to be backfilled and replaced. You know, the troops that come in now, the equipment that replaces the equipment that was destroyed, huge amounts. 
is not as good. It's not as well-trained, the equipment's older, and so on. So they, it's one of those things where you can't just try again because you don't have the same resources with which to try again. And that said, all of that said, there's a lot of caution in just dismissing the ability of the Russians to learn. One big worry is that the dog that didn't bark in this fight has been the Russian Air Force, which is, you know, very large and does have very capable aircraft, very capable missiles and so on. And they failed to impose air superiority, which changed the whole nature of the war. I was going to say, Mark, there was one thing I was curious about with the Air Force that you mentioned, and it's come up a lot, is why did they not use their Air Force to greater effect in the early stages of the war? Why did they not really deploy that to full effect and also potentially bombing more targets in the early stages of the war? Why did they seemingly rely so much on the ground? And that's a a question that we hear a lot. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's a number of elements. One is that taking out air defences is one of the hardest things to do. And they may just not have been very well trained for it. It's not the the task that they spent all their time training for. They may not have had as many hours in training as they should have had and so on. But another factor is simply that because, you know, in the early stages, the early hours of the campaign, there was this complete misconception of what was going to happen. So in those first critical couple of days at the beginning, the Air Force went in, it bombed various targets. It actually didn't have very good information. It was quite out of date. And immediately it became clear that the ground forces were getting into trouble. So the Air Force was diverted um, into a support role for the ground forces and therefore weren't spending all their time trying to take out the air defenses, the airfields and so on. And the Ukrainians had time to move their planes so that they wouldn't get destroyed, so that they weren't where they, the Russians expected them to be. So, you know, there's sort of a number of elements in there that people are sort of trying to pick apart. But obviously, you know, none of us were in the cockpits you know, or in the, you know, in the command structure and know exactly what happened. But that seems to have been a contributor. Dasha, and it wasn't just Russia's poor planning and poor execution, but a remarkable response by Ukraine's military, which was everything that the Russian military has not been. It has been fast. It's been innovative. It's been efficient in the use of its weapons. It's even when it was greatly outpowered, it made better use of what it had. How has Ukraine been able to essentially be so nimble in the face of superior firepower? Well, people say that, first of all, uh, motivation means, right? And here Ukrainians uh, are fighting for their land, while when you ask a Russian what he is doing here, it's kind of hard to get an answer from him. Um, You know, there are lots of captured uh, Russian soldiers and um, some... uh, People record interviews with them and they say that, oh, yeah, we just watched Russian propaganda saying that Ukraine uh, turned into our enemy. But they couldn't really explain in a way why they would think that Ukraine might attack Russia at any point because Ukraine is much, much smaller than Russia and has much less resources than Russia has. For Ukrainians, it's motivation. In the first days of the war, we had such a huge lines to military units as men were trying to register and join the army that it was enormous lines and it was uh, cold. It was February and people stayed at night to be registered and join the army. So as a result, now the army is full of like professionals starting from, I don't know, from theater and ballet ending with tennis players and IT specialists, etc. But people are motivated. They want to learn. They are being trained, not only in Ukraine, but also by our Western partners. And they prove themselves to be capable to learn. And this obviously makes a much difference as we see during the war. So the other thing to remember is that, you know, the war began in 2014, not in 2022. And it began with the annexation of Crimea, of course, and then an insurgency which the Russians armed and at times sent their own troops in to take part in. And you had a quite serious war in 2014 and 15. About 14,000 people died. And, you know, then you had a peace settlement, which was really a ceasefire, and the firing never ceased. So all along a, you know, a, a front line, there were trenches, you know, opposite each other, artillery being, shells being exchanged. 
you know, reconnaissance parties going across the other side to get behind the lines. Uh, so for eight years, the Ukrainians were preparing. Uh, they had had a non-existent army, in part because the, through the previous pro-Russian government had actually dismantled parts of the military. Large arms depots had been blown up over a period of years, so it was quite deliberate. And so for eight years, they did have the chance to rebuild and to train. They were rotating you know, estimates run from three to 500,000 soldiers who rotated through the trenches, spent, you know, six months tours fighting. So you had almost half a million people who had direct recent experience of fighting. At the same time, they were getting training from NATO partners, NATO training and so on. And they restructured the armed forces so that they would have a more kind of Western-style armed force. And the critical thing there was that you have a strong non-commissioned officer corps, these sort of low-level officers who are very much in connection, working very closely with the ordinary troops. And they're a kind of mentoring force, provide experience, support, and all that sort of thing. And all of that has really helped the Ukrainians more than I think anybody thought training could help. But it's helped a lot. And I think the second thing I was just going to mention that I think has made a difference is the the use of intelligence. The you know knowing that they were outgunned at times by ten to twelve to one in terms of the amount of artillery shells that were being fired, the Ukrainians understood that they had to find a way to make every shell count, and they have. And there's a number of apps and so on, you know, at the front line that are being used, that very sophisticated apps, uh, that are being used in order to connect drone intelligence and other kinds of data and just put it in the hands of the people who are actually firing the guns. And these apps will calculate for them exactly, once they've got the coordinates, it'll calculate for them exactly what the trajectory of the missile should be and how they should aim it. And they are simply much, much better at hitting a target. Our conversation continues after the break. We defeated Russia in the battle for minds of the world. We have no fear, nor should anyone in the world have it. Ukraine's gained this victory, and it gives us courage, which inspires the entire world. Raz, one person who has been at the center of this, of course, is uh, Ukraine's President Zelensky. He's become a very visible international figure, testifying before the U.S. Congress, going to other capitals to make the case why the world must keep its attention on Ukraine, must keep delivering arms and other aid to Ukraine. How important has President Zelensky been in maintaining Ukraine's unity at home and also its ability to keep fighting? Well, incredibly important and arguably he's been just the president that Ukraine needed in this moment. And it's funny thinking about the run up to the war now in a way because he people tended to dismiss him very much as someone who didn't have the heft uh, to be a president during wartime. Uh, you know, of course, there was all this talk that he might even leave the country and famously he declined the offer to do so. But you can see that his skills at presenting a message, at selling, in fact, Ukraine's cause in this moment relentlessly on social media, videos, all of it, appearing speeches at parliaments, you know, you name it, he's done it. He's done anything that he can to remind people that this war is going on, that Ukraine needs more money and more weapons to keep fighting and no event is too small or too large to do that. And you could say arguably that's made a tremendous difference in keeping the world's attention on Ukraine in rallying calls for money and weapons. If you look at other conflicts around the world that have gone on for a period of time, you can see that there's been a real challenge to maintain that kind of momentum. And perhaps that challenge will come for Ukraine if this war goes on for another year or beyond. But you can see You know, some of that concern creeping in potentially now. You've seen uh, President Zelensky leaving Ukraine more regularly, uh, coming directly to the rest of the world to spread that message. You, You kind of saw that very clearly in his recent trip to the UK and to France and to Brussels, very much perhaps recognizing that this is a moment where he needs to work even harder to do that. So in terms of just being sort of the front facing 
element of, of the war for Ukraine. He's really, really done his job. Uh, how much he has sort of been important behind the scenes in terms of directing the war effort and so on is less clear. And perhaps Dash or Mark might have views on that. But if, if he had just had to do one thing in this moment, and that's simply to really sort of like keep Ukraine front and centre for the world, then certainly he's delivered. Ross, you're exactly right. He did the right thing. He concentrated on delivering the message to the world. And he's very good at that because his background is showbiz. He knows how to do videos. He knows how to reach the audience. He has an excellent speechwriter. So the, you know, words really touch people. And locally, he doesn't really, at least was not really involved in planning operations. He picked up a very capable top army chief. And the guy is doing his job and he, not just Zelensky himself, doesn't interfere in that because, as he said, it's up to military people to decide operations. Mark, these appeals that President Zelensky has made around the world have been, you know, met with a lot of aid from the U.S., from Europe, from other parts of the world, providing a lot of munitions and some sophisticated weaponry. Well, the U.S. and Germany are poised to announce that they will provide main battle tanks to Ukraine. Germany's defense minister says Chancellor Olaf Scholz is talking to his allies about supplying Kyiv with the Leopard tank. Today, I'm announcing that the United States will be sending 31 Abram tanks to Ukraine, the equivalent of one Ukrainian battalion. And that's the conversation that we've been having most recently about how can we provide air defense to protect the Ukrainian population. That has been the thing that we've talked about probably most in all of our conversations, which is why we've provided thousands of surface-to-air missiles and air defense systems, and we'll continue to do so, and more are coming over the next few weeks. I think in the beginning of the war, there was some question about whether the West would give as much as it has for fear of provoking Russia into a wider war. And yet, as it's gone on, the West has really stepped up. Certainly I, before this war began, and certainly President Putin, the expectation was that Europe would not really be as united or determined as it has been and that it couldn't last very long. The record, you know, in the response to Crimea, the response to the fighting in Georgia in 2008 was not good in that sense. You know, I'm very struck that the perspective is different. So the first thing to remember is this is a high intensity war that we haven't seen since World War II. Um, and that, you know, those kinds of wars, they require just mass mobilization of economic resources, people, etc. And so seen from Kiev, you know, there's a lot of gratitude about the weapons that have come, a complete understanding that without them, they wouldn't really have been able to survive, certainly wouldn't be able to think about whether they can take the territory back. But at the same time, real failure to understand why it always takes so long, that it is this long ratcheted process where you begin with, you know, shoulder held anti-tank missiles, and then it takes a while before you get to, you know, bigger artillery, even though it's very clear that the Ukrainians desperately need the big artillery. And then it takes a while before you get to, you know, the next thing, you know, to the big air defense or to the tanks. And now, of course, they're, you know, sort of pressing for jets. And so from their point of view, if they had been given everything they've been given right away, then, you know, the outcome might have been much better for Ukraine. This question of tanks and jets has been going on for quite some time now. At first, the Germany, Poland, other nations were hesitant to give over tanks. And now, as Mark describes, that's sort of softening and those are, are moving toward Ukraine. Jets seem to be a real sticking point, though. Do you think, ultimately, that Ukraine will receive jets from Western militaries? You know, more and more countries are sort of looking at how much they've sent in and also going, well, wow, we're running really low <laughs> ourselves. And defense companies just can't sort of turn on a switch at a factory and magically produce a whole lot of extra equipment with great speed. That's why we're seeing talk about a common fund potentially for the EU for ammunition. But that would be to sort of like get companies to start making ammunition in six to nine months from now. And you know, a lot of countries have got stockpiles that have been depleted. And, you know, there's a point where they have to sort of say, well, we can't actually send 
anymore. And of course, they haven't said、um, modern fighter jets, but as they don't necessarily have a lot of them to start with. And countries like Poland say, well, we can't send them unless we had a guarantee from the U.S. of replacement. And there's no certainty. About that either, and if you look at the language around fighter jets, yeah, they're sort of saying, well, we could look at it maybe in the longer term. There could be an assessment about it, but the language on that remains really, really cautious,、um, and suggests that that's really quite a large hurdle to get over. We'll be right back. Raz, after one year of fighting, Ukraine is looking at. Another year ahead. I don't think anyone expects this war to be over anytime soon. What can we expect in the months ahead? Well, the question is: Is Russia really going to launch a major offensive, or has it already started, as Mark talked about earlier? And is it not sort of one big shebang moment, or is it just sort of a gradual increase in intensity in the coming months? Because Russia obviously sees a window here before Ukraine does start to get some of that more advanced weaponry, which is sort of months away. So now would be the time to sort of try and gain more territory, rather. In the east,、um, and that's a difficult time potentially for Ukraine in the coming weeks to be able to sort of hold that back, and that's perhaps reflected in the sense of how people are feeling that Mark and Dasha were talking about earlier in Kiev at the moment,、um, because any kind of full offensive by Ukraine is probably some months away and more likely to come in the south. But as you say, like beyond that. We just headed for the reality that a war that will go on for another year or more, even、uh, you know, possibly three, four years, does it turn into a grinding conflict just in the east and the south? And the challenge there for Ukraine, obviously, is again keeping momentum for the world on its plight there and supporting its military. Or do people sort of get to the point where that fatigue does set in? So it's probably quite a difficult time ahead for Ukraine potentially in all of that. Apart from this situation that is now more challenging in the east, Ukraine launched those two very successful counteroffensive operations back、uh, last year, because there was also an element of surprise. The、uh, kind of just unexpectedly for Russia launched it in the north of the country and then in the south. Now it's kind of options are much more limited, and of course Russians are preparing for that for、uh, any possible Ukrainian counteroffensive. This is on one side. On the other side, there is question of economy. Last year,、uh, obviously, there was some, you know, sa- some stuff left from the previous years. You know, this year, at least from what I hear from companies, it's going to be more difficult for them、uh, to operate. Plus, it's、uh, unclear what's going to happen with the world economy. Obviously, it has an impact here, and also a very important、uh, part of、uh, Ukraine's, if you want, rebuilding after the war. There is a question of migration. Whether people who left the country, those were mainly women with kids, they fled the country last year. Many of them already found jobs there. So once The war is over. The question is whether people would come back, or rather, men who are now prohibited to leave the country, and after the war obviously ends,、uh, all limitations will be lifted out. Whether those husbands will rather join their families in the European Union, which means Ukraine will lose lots of people. Mark, the last time you were on this podcast talking about Ukraine, you said that Vladimir Putin's own personal investment, his own reputation, is so. Tied up in winning this war, that you didn't see any way in which he would accept a settlement in which he was seen as having lost. Do you think that that's more or less true now? Ultimately, most conflicts end with some kind of settlement, and at the moment, it's almost impossible to see any room for a settlement because for Ukraine the issue is to recover their territory. And for Russia, for President Putin, the issue is to gain the territory that he has annexed, because he annexed you know, several provinces, declared that they were now part of Russia,、um, and we, his troops didn't even occupy all of them. So you have these two sets of goals that are in complete conflict. So it's very, very difficult to see how any time soon there can be any kind of settlement. Neither side has an interest. Neither side. Is exhausted. The Ukrainians have, you know, still a motivated force. They're they're still getting armed, and the and the Russians have 
mobilized and sent, you know, several hundred thousand new troops to the front. They now have more in Ukraine than they had at the beginning of the war. So it remains true. And the question always is, uh, what can he sell it as a victory? And I do think, you know, the, the sort of glimmer of light there is that in the same way that he has been able to cr- control the message at home, you know, in, as far as a kind of mendacious way about what's happening in Ukraine, there is a glimmer of hope that if he decides that he needs to sell something that is objectively a defeat as a victory, he may be able to do so. But I think that that basic point that he can't afford, strong men cannot afford to lose, that remains. And it's only a question of what losing consists of. Dasha, Raz, Mark, thanks so much for talking with me today. Thank you. Thanks, Wes. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicky Bergolino. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Federica Romaniello is our producer. Our associate producer is Zenab Siddiqui. Rafael M. Seeley is our engineer. And our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take. <laughs>